Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Ted Haggard? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing you in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the scandal, then offer my analysis. Ted Haggard was born in Yorktown, Indiana on June 27, 1956. After being strongly influenced by the works of the Christian apologist C.S. Lewis, Ted became a born-again Christian at the age of 16. Ted went to college and studied telecommunications and journalism. His father offered to buy him a new Pontiac Le Mans if he enrolled at Oral Roberts University in Oklahoma instead. Ted took the deal and started his Pontiac fuel journey through this college. He graduated in 1978 and was ordained as Southern Baptist. That same year, he married a woman named Gail. They would go on to have five children over the next 15 years and are still married at the time I'm making this video. Ted became an associate pastor for a church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It was there that he had a vision of founding a church in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He moved there and established a church he referred to as New Life Church which initially operated out of the basement of his house. As the church grew, he moved it into a strip mall and then to a multi-million dollar campus in northern Colorado Springs. From 2003 to 2006, Ted was the president of the National Association of Evangelicals. He had risen to a position of tremendous power and influence. He was frequently featured in the media. Over time, the congregation at his church grew. By 2006, the church had 14,000 members. Ted developed his own philosophy that went along with his overarching religious beliefs. He believed that all Christians lived in one of two places referenced in the book of Genesis, the tree of life or the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Essentially, he believed that people who treated the sins of others with forgiveness and understanding lived in the tree of life. They had wisdom, insight, and joy. On the other hand, people who were judgmental lived in the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they ended up in a world of frustration and death. Now moving to the timeline of the scandal. A male sex worker named Mike Jones came forward in November of 2006 and claimed that Ted Haggard was one of his customers and that Ted had purchased methamphetamine. Mike claimed that he initially didn't know who Ted was. Eventually, Mike found out that Ted was a pastor preaching against gay marriage. Ted was supporting a referendum in Colorado that would ban same-sex marriage in that state. Mike Jones was hoping that by exposing Ted's hypocrisy, people would vote against the referendum. Ted responded to the accusations by denying everything. He did not have a relationship with Mike Jones. Rather, he was faithful to his wife. He had never used any type of drug, no alcohol, no cigarettes, no marijuana, no methamphetamine, nothing at all. The problem for Ted is that Mike Jones had a voicemail, which featured Ted asking for methamphetamine. Ted had an explanation for this. He said that he purchased methamphetamine, but threw it away. He was tempted to use it, but he refrained. Ted denied ever meeting Mike Jones. It sounds as though Ted was trying to top Bill Clinton's story about not inhaling marijuana. On November 2, 2006, officials from New Life Church announced that Ted admitted that some of the claims made by Mike Jones were true. Ted admitted not only to the part about buying methamphetamine, but to meeting Mike Jones. Ted said that he only received a massage. No sex occurred. Later, Ted would admit to using drugs and having sexual contact. Ted was forced to resign from the church that he founded. The church officials determined that Ted was guilty of sexually immoral conduct. Ted received three weeks of counseling, from four ministers, he was treated with eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing, otherwise known as EMDR. One of those ministers said that Ted was completely heterosexual after being treated. Ted entered into an agreement with his now former church. They would continue to pay his salary and his wife's salary for 14 months. This came to about $200,000 plus other various benefits. In order to get the severance pay from the church, Ted had to agree to leave the state of Colorado. 
cease contact with any church members, and give up ministry-related work. The New Life Church was trying to be true to their name. They were suggesting it was time for Ted to get a new life. Ted took the deal and moved with his wife and children to Phoenix, Arizona. He referred to it as his exile. The family lived in various places, like at a friend's house and in hotels. Ted tried to find traditional employment not related to any type of church. He eventually started selling health insurance. At one point, Ted attended the University of Phoenix to pursue some type of degree related to mental health counseling. Even though Ted had earned about $138,000 a year from his job as a pastor and had this massive severance package, he was quickly out of money. He sent out letters asking for donations, which only led to more controversy. He was accustomed to making his living by people giving him money rather than him earning money. Ted's severance arrangement ended in June 2008. Therefore, he was free to move back to his residence in Colorado Springs. In November, Ted gave some sermons at a church in Illinois where he appeared to blame his behavior on some type of mistreatment that allegedly occurred when he was seven. A few years later, he suggested that his childhood experiences were not an excuse. He fell into sin and failed to extract himself. He was responsible. At another point, Ted said that he had engaged in sex play in the seventh grade with another male, and it all blew up at age 50. Ted started an apology tour in January 2009 after the release of the documentary titled The Trials of Ted Haggard. He and his wife appeared on shows like Good Morning America, The Oprah Winfrey Show, and Larry King Live. Ted accepted responsibility for his actions and apologized. During an interview with CNN in July of 2010, Ted reported that his feelings of sexual attraction toward other men had miraculously disappeared. He also backed away a bit from his encounter with Mike Jones, suggesting that it was a massage that somehow went awry. In the summer of 2010, Ted started a new church in his barn called St. James Church. He was once again a pastor, and I guess a farmer at the same time. In 2015, he switched his ordination to the Free Methodist Church. In April of 2020, church elders from St. James Church asked Ted to step down after two men came forward and said that Ted inappropriately touched them on multiple occasions in 2019. One of these accusers was a minor when this allegedly happened. Ted retained his title as pastor and moved the church services to his residence under the name Story House Church. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few items that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, a few of Ted's beliefs were more liberal than many of his colleagues. For example, he thought the church should emphasize helping sinners and not being moralistic. Even though he opposed same-sex marriage, he believed that same-sex couples should have access to the same benefits as heterosexual couples. Ted believed that there should be an active debate in the church, which would welcome disagreement. And he created a pay structure where all pastors were paid fairly and would get regular increases in salary. People try to make it seem as though Ted was a crusader for the far right, but he really wasn't. Which brings me to item number two. The church that Ted established and led treated him in a way that was different than his teachings. He was dealt with much more harshly than he would have dealt with somebody else in a similar situation. The irony is that Ted was trapped by a system that he helped create. Considering that Ted was in charge of the church, why didn't he write something into the rules that would have protected him in the event he was caught doing something wrong? Kind of like he needed to hide a get-out-of-jail-free card from a Monopoly game in there somewhere. Something like, pastors who use drugs will be kicked out of the church, except methamphetamine. Pastors who use methamphetamine will get double pay and a promotion. There is the sense that 10 minutes with word processing software could have saved Ted a lot of trouble. Something else that occurs to me that is similar to this is how unprepared Ted was financially. When he was in exile, he was financially destroyed. I can appreciate that Ted may have had a mortgage on his residence in Colorado Springs, and perhaps other debt, but it seems amazing to me that he struggled financially from November 2006 to June 2008, even though he and his wife were paid $200,000. How much money did they need to live? Again, it just seems like Ted was not very good at planning. 
It's kind of frightening to think that he was in charge of such a large organization for so long, yet not able to manage his own money. I suppose Ted ultimately learned that money doesn't grow on trees, whether it's the tree of life or the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Item number three. The HBO documentary about Ted is somewhat painful to watch, not because it's poorly made or anything, but because it featured Ted during his so-called exile. The filmmaker follows Ted around as he looks for places to stay and tries to find a secular job. It's clear that Ted does not have many skills that translate to making a living outside of a church environment. The filmmaker repeatedly reminds Ted how at one time he was successful, but now he was not. The first time that she did this, it seemed like an important observation, but after a few times, it just appeared to be mean. It's almost like she was saying, hey Ted, do you remember when you were a winner? Because you're definitely not a winner anymore. How does that feel? I'm pretty sure Ted fully understood how at one time he had power and money, and he lost all of it. Maybe the idea of kicking him when he was down was to make him a sympathetic character. If that was the plan, I think for some viewers it worked, but others took delight in seeing Ted relive the cost of his hypocrisy. Moving to item number four, it appears as though Ted really struggled reconciling his sexuality with his religious belief system. His attraction to men clearly conflicts with even a relatively liberal interpretation of his values. Ted was not the one who made the statement about how he was completely heterosexual after receiving three weeks of counseling, and in 2011, he said that if he were 21, he would identify as bisexual. There is the sense with Ted that he is thoughtful, but permanently adrift. He's really trying to figure out how he fits into the world, but he's just going around in circles. He clearly likes being involved in ministry, and he views himself as staying faithful to his wife, but at the same time, he needs to understand his sexuality. I think Ted gets labeled as a hypocrite and therefore automatically as a bad person, but his situation is more complex than that. Item number five, I talked before about how a church leader proclaimed that Ted was completely heterosexual after receiving EMDR for three weeks. There are two important points to make here. One is that counseling cannot change someone's sexual orientation. Many people have tried using counseling for this purpose, but there is no scientific reason to believe that they can achieve that goal. The second point is about EMDR in general. This treatment modality essentially combines an unproven treatment technique called bilateral stimulation with an older, well-established treatment modality called exposure and response prevention. Eye movement is the primary method used to accomplish the bilateral stimulation. Like a client will move their eyes back and forth, and somehow this is supposed to do something significant in their brain. Many studies have shown that the eye movement component is not effective at treating any mental health symptoms. Other methods used to achieve bilateral stimulation are not effective either. For example, tapping one's legs. Exposure and response prevention, however, has been found to be effective at treating a number of mental health symptoms. The reason that EMDR has been found effective in some studies is because of the exposure and response prevention component. This is the only active ingredient. EMDR is an example of a therapy that was built using an established modality, exposure and response prevention, and adding something useless to it, namely bilateral stimulation. Now moving to my final thoughts. There are certain trade-offs when someone chooses to be a pastor. One of them is that to maintain success, they must follow the rules of their church. Ted was unable or unwilling to do this. After he was caught, he was reluctant to own his own behavior, and it's still not clear if he ever truly owned it 100%. Like, it's not clear if he's telling the entire truth. I'm sure Ted has many lessons about spirituality and life that he wants to give to people, but I think more can be learned from observing his behavior through this scandal. Ted's greatest lessons are on the topics of hypocrisy, and deception. Those are my thoughts on the case of Ted Haggard. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis on this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.